Well, it's another beautiful, sunny Saturday morning here in Phoenix, and we're glad you could join us for another edition of Bumper to Bumper Radio. I'm Matt Allen, your KTR car guy, along with Dave Riccio. I think he's the automotive therapist. <laughs> so if your car needs a couch... <laughs> Lay down, and, we'll uh, fix it. We're here, as always, every Saturday from 11 to noon, right here on News Talk 92.3 KTAR. We are creating realistic expectations for your auto repair. So if you've got car questions, car problems, want to know anything about maybe how to handle a situation or deal with your car, all you have to do is give us a call at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. Today on the Bumper to Bumper Roadmap, how do you talk to the shop if you think something went wrong with your repair? Or maybe you think they broke something else because there's a new problem. Open phones as always. Air conditioning, air conditioning, air conditioning. It's getting warm. What do we do? And uh, we brought in a friend from Air Park Auto Service today to help us help you with your car. Dave? Yes, we've got a good friend of mine, Aaron Nelson from Air Park Auto Service. They're in the Air Park at uh, Hayden and Raintree. And uh, they're a member shop at bumper to bumper radio.com. Somehow they're at the top of the list on that page. So, uh, Aaron, it's getting warm. Air conditioned service. Are you ready for it? Yes, we are. <laughs> probably, we probably saw a few last week, but tell us a little bit first about, about Air Park Auto Service. I know you've been there a long time. You've probably uh, well worn into your desk and, and probably know just about all those customers by name, right? Pretty much, yeah. I've been there almost 20 years now, so I know a lot of my name and new ones get to know their names and get to be as friends, you know. And Air Park Auto Service has been around 25 plus years at least, uh, you know, and you've been there 20? 20 years this month, yeah. 20 years. We talk about having a relationship with a shop. When you've worked with a guy for 20 years who's been fixing your car, that's the kind of relationship that we are talking about, a long-term relationship with a shop. So, Well, yeah, I mean, it's nice. You go to the grocery store. You run into your customers. They're mm-hmm. your neighbors. You see them at the Little League games or at church, and, and uh, there's just this comfort level. You know you're doing business with good people, and more importantly, or just as important, they know they're in hands that they can trust. So that's the... The beauty of, of, of a lot of the shops on, on Bumper to Bumper Radio are just they're in the community and involved in it's the small business. It's not the 25 location franchise or the you know the big box store. These are your neighbors. Well, since you're talking about uh, many, many, many locations, and I think of some of the big guys that have a lot of locations, they run a lot of coupons. And, and uh, today we're talking about air condition. And... Uh, Matt came in this morning and printed up a bunch of coupons off the internet, and he was uh, mystery shopping auto shops to see what what the going deal is out there for air conditioned service. And uh, you know, I see a lot of nineteen ninety nine. I can get my air condition fixed for nineteen ninety nine. No, sir. No. <laughs> Come on. Well, and, and what do you mean fixed? And what do you mean serviced? And what do you mean checked? They're, they're, that that's so subjective. That there's there's some. W- we have to, we said setting expect tech, uh, realistic expectations. A lot of times, I mean, if your car is blowing cool air and not cold air, you've probably lost some refrigerant. There's a leak somewhere. We may or may not be able to identify that leak right away, but there's a process for going about doing that. And when you see service coupons for 1995 to check your air conditioning that says free on and labor is extra, what exactly is that? It, you really don't – that's an opportunity to pay $20 to maybe look and say, okay, we need to service it. So those are what I would call a loss leader. Now, I went and found various um, – $29, uh, check the belt, check the system. I don't know what check the system means. Um, Freon, die, and labor are additional. Hmm. D- it didn't fix anything. Another how one, another how one. much was that one? That was 29 uh, here's one for 19. Check belts and tighten hoses. Leaks and Freon are extra. Uh, the best one I came actually came from a dealership. $119. I called them. They do it the right way. We have to recover. Uh, recover what's in the system. We need to measure. These are very delicate. Some of these systems hold. We're measuring by the ounce, not by the pound anymore. And that maybe they hold 16 ounces. So we have to know exactly how much you had in the system before we can 
top it off. You can't top it off before we can refill it. So the really the right way to do that is to recover everything. We recycle it, run it through our machine, and then recharge it. So maybe your car holds 1.6, I can't even do my math now, 16 ounces. So we pull out eight, that means you're eight short. So we're going to add, add a total of 16 back. Well, we can't just arbitrarily just go adding some Freon until we think it blows cool because you could overcharge by a couple ounces, 10%. You're, now you're going backwards, and overcharge will hurt the system. Well, that's where we come up with the rules are changing, and we're talking about it continually on this show is that what you used to do and what you do now are two different things. We used to have systems that held, you know, I'm thinking of the old, Three pounds. old <laughs> Suburban with rear air condition. You could pump five pounds in that thing with, uh, you know, it was R12 back in the day. And that's not the way it works anymore. If you were off by an ounce then, it really didn't matter. If you're off by an ounce now, it's a huge difference. And uh, Aaron was talking about they do really two levels. There's kind of a basic check, and I think we're talking about some basic checks. Don't really have a problem. You know, we're going to look at the belt. We're going to look at the compressor. We're going to look for any visible signs. But there's not a lot that's going on, and something like that, I think he said maybe $39, $49, somewhere in in that area. But it's not really fixing anything. Um, And it's not even necessarily adding any Freon to the system. It's just doing the visual. You might check the pressures to see if there's anything out of whack. But that's a pretty much a good working system. Yeah, and a lot of the manufacturers are coming with dye in the system. So a lot of the services, or most all servicers, will add a add a, a dye in there. And that dye travels around with the oil that's in the system. And when it leaks... It will push that dye out with the oil, and we can see that with an ultraviolet light. So most, a lot of cars that have been serviced, we don't have to go through the recharge and all of that stuff. Uh, we can look at it with the, with the ultraviolet light and our special goggles and see this stuff glowing green like your shirt today that I just <laughs> noticed. And, uh, and, um, and you can do that, and that's part of that basic inspection. But then to think for to, – to have the expectation that $39 is going to fix your air conditioner – Right. It's not good. Mm -hmm. Now, on a car that's probably not even blowing cold air, I would suspect that we're not even going to go down the $39 route. We need to make sure that it has a full charge in it, run through, make sure the system works. Just because you have a leaking hose doesn't mean the compressor is bad, but but you've got to get a charge in it and test the – even if it does have a leak, we don't want to just go put the hose on and then get a surprise that your compressor is no good. So we've got to get the thing working, even if it has – maybe it's not a catastrophic leak, but it's – got a leak we've got to get it working so that we're comfortable knowing that once we put the hose on we're going to be in good shape and this is often a two-step process well that's and we're talking about refrigerant does it have the right fill in the system we're talking about leaks but there's another air condition failure that i would think about and that's the blower motor and the fan and the blend doors in the dashboard so that's kind of a different different route that you're going you know the the air ac compressor may be making the system cool but if the fan's not working that blows across that evaporative core you you have nothing well, yeah, it's my AC doesn't work. So is it is it blowing cool air, just not cold air, or is it not blowing at all? And then there's so many. I mean, there's so many different things that we have. We have could have a condenser fan motor that's bad. We could have a uh, a leak in a hose. We could have a like you said, Dave, a blend door not working. That and that's where it's blending hot and cold air. If you want your air to be 74 degrees, it can't be pumping all 30 degrees. It's got to it's got to use some heat to make it the right temperature in the in the cabin. Uh, so we, we've got to worry about leak sealers in the system that can damage our equipment. We've got to worry about contaminated refrigerant, which is out there. So if I'm if I'm listening and it just got hot, so I turn on my air conditioner in my car, you know, for the first time this week, and I haven't turned it on in months. And if it would have not worked, I'm thinking of you listening in your car saying, what do I do? What's the next step? What can be the expectation? And I think really if it's blowing cool but not cold or it's just blowing warm, you're going to be starting somewhere, really, expect a 100 to $200 range. That's for someone to evacuate the system, drag it all the way down to zero, and pull a vacuum on it, and then refill it with the appropriate fill of Freon. So 100 to $200 is a reasonable expectation. Now, the next thing that you need to understand is this may be a two-step process. So maybe they added dye or maybe it had dye before, but now we're going we're gonna to check for obvious leaks, and, and sometimes we can see obvious leaks before we even put Freon in it but not always, you know, and there's a couple places we can't see, and some are up underneath the dashboard, and you're honestly not going to know there's a leak there unless you pull the dashboard out of the car. Yeah, you're going up through the drain tube and the condenser, or for the evaporator or something like that, and 
yeah, it, it's just oftentimes it's it's a two it's a two step deal, and you and you may have to come back, and that's normal. So anyway, when we come back, we've got Levi, Paul, looks like uh, Reuben, and Steve, and we've got open lines at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio, the automotive therapist, and one of these days Matt will understand what the automotive therapist is. I, 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 I'm, I'm the automotive healer. Well, yesterday I put on my blues and I got in the shop. Actually, I got new wheels and tires for my car. And I decided that I really wanted to learn how to use a road force balancer because back when I was doing tires, we didn't have such a thing. So I loaded up my wheels and headed over to Matt's place. And I got a tour of the road force balancer. And this kid showed me how to use it. And after it was all done, I still didn't know how to use it. <laughs> I said, just, just point and tell me where to bang the weight on, and I'll bang the weight on the wheel. <laughs> well, you know, I didn't realize when you were doing that. I was, I was watching, and I don't know how to really use the machine. I know what it does, but you asked Chris, hey, how long did it take you to learn this machine? And he said three months. I didn't really even oh, know that. I mean, that machine is, is – There is so many things. It tells you that which, which tire to put where to make the car do certain things. If you wanted to pull it right, put this tire on the right front. If you wanted to you know, not pull, put this tire in the back. It's amazing what that thing does. I would have liked to have mounted those tires up and put them on just a normal – there's my phone ringing. A normal, a normal balancer. Rookie mistake. <laughs> Put them on a normal balancer because when we were done with those, three out of the four tires took no weight uh, at all. It was perfect. It was so. perfect. So uh, road force balancing, that's a term you may hear come up. So uh, I'm Dave Riccio with Matt Allen, and we've got Aaron Nelson from Air Park Auto Service, which is at Hayden and Raintree, uh, one of the great shops at BumperToBumperRadio.com. So up for this segment, we're going to go with Looks like Paul in Gilbert on a 1999 Chevrolet Tahoe. Go ahead, Paul. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. All right. How you guys doing? Doing great. Thank you. Hey, um, okay, so I have one shop that I've gone to for a long time. I mean, I I believe that my truck's been in the shop probably since my mom was the original owner of the truck. So I trust the guy. But I'm starting to do more things on my own, and I'm wondering. I, ch- I had a check engine light. The truck was shaky a little bit at certain high speeds. And I had a check engine light. They said it was a uh, cylinder five misfire. Now I've replaced the spark plug, spark plug wires. Where do I go next, or is this out of my hands? Ninety, and this is on the uh, ninety-nine Tahoe. Tahoe cylinder five That's- misfire. No change after you did the spark plug and wire. No, and you know I noticed that mostly. I mean. If I'm coming on the freeway and I stay out of the gas, you know, just go real easy, the shaking starts around like 65 or 70, but it only lasts for a minute, and then it'll go away. Um, but if I, you know, get on it to, you know, kind of merge or anything like that, I notice the shaking a whole lot more. Okay. And the check engine light has been on it, and it's currently off right now. So after a while, it'll turn off. But when it does, I've had to check twice, and it says it's a cylinder five misfire. And I'm sorry, you did the plug in the coil, is that right? That's correct. Okay. Well, normally what we would do in the shop, I mean, the easy diagnosis, and sometimes, you know, we take it, we get the blinders on and get snake bit because, oh, well, it's going to be the plug or the wire or the coil. So typically what we would do is just switch a coil and do a test drive. From cylinder five to cylinder four. And if it, if it follows, then you've probably got a bad coil. Um, you've already replaced the coil, so it clearly wasn't that. Make sure you didn't damage any of the spark plugs. At this point, I'd probably be looking for some sort of vacuum leak on that car, but I would expect to maybe see a lean condition. Aaron, I mean, what, I mean, uh, where where would you approach this if someone brought that into Air Park? We're gonna we have to start with some testing. Yeah, you got to start with some testing. Go through the diagnostics of it. Look for vacuum leaks. Uh, make sure that the coil is firing. Make sure you're getting power to the coil. Everything to make it fire. Yeah, you got to have yeah. compression. You've got to have compression. You've got to have fuel. You got to have compression, and you got to have spark. You probably had have, have good spark with a plug and a coil. Although that coil has a short spark plug wire on it too on that model, I believe there's a three or four inch spark plug. How many wire. misfires do you guys see that are caused because of vacuum leaks? That's fairly kind of a lean misfire that you get with a vacuum leak, or is that not that common? If it's if it's um, We'll see a random misfire typically if it's a vacuum leak, but that's usually associated with maybe a mass airflow sensor failure or a lean fuel condition. Intake gasket leaking. Yeah. But if you have something, a vacuum leak that's very specific to one runner or a blown gasket, 
you're not going to necessarily see the lean condition. You're going to get the misfire. For sure. Um, well, thanks so much for the call, Paul. Let's go with Levi in Phoenix on a 2002 Saturn. Go ahead, Levi. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Go ahead, Levi. You're up. What's your question? Ooh, All maybe. right. We're going to come back to Levi. So that leaves us uh, Dodge in the garage. We've got Steve in Queen Creek on a 97 Dodge 1500. Go ahead, Steve. You're on Bumper to Bumper. Hey, morning, guys. Great show. Thank you. Hey, um, about 18 months ago, I mixed Dex Cool with regular Prestone in my truck, not knowing that it would turn the radiator fluid pretty much to mud. <laughs> so I I've flushed it a few times and I've had um issues with it kind of clogging and then overheating. And so last night I was driving around and um there was just this big poof of smoke or steam and I pulled it over. It wasn't leaking or anything like that, but um I couldn't find a hose that was broken. The radiator cap was still on. Um do you guys have any idea where that may have come from why did you add coolant in the first place i guess that's my question well i i mixed the two not knowing that when you do that it caused the uh the, the coolant to kind of coagulate but what right? was that's, what that's was the, the e- what was the episode that caused you to add coolant did you see a leak did you replace a hose or was it just low so you added a quart or two or no what? Yeah, it was just low. Okay, so we, well, it sounds like there might be a there's probably a leak. That's why it was low then. But what? Where did your steam come from that you saw the other day? That's what I don't know. I lifted the hood, and I there was probably a gallon of, of fluid all over up under the hood and um, on the ground and everything. But I couldn't find where that came from. I couldn't find it, you know, a hose that had split or, uh, like I said, the radiator cap or anything like that. Okay. So, well, here's where I would start. Get all that stuff rinsed off from underneath the hood. And, and if you can flush some just clean water, you don't need to have coolant in the system to be testing it or anything. Just let's try and get much of the gook out of it as you can. If you're mechanically inclined to do so and, and remove one of the heater hoses, maybe flush some water through the heater core, let's get the thing full of just water. If you want to put a little bit of Dex cool in it with water so it'll help you maybe find the leak, let's get it dried off under the hood. And I would start, just put a radiator cap on it if it doesn't have a newer radiator cap. Get one on there because very well what could have been happening, if you don't have pressure there, the system is going to boil at a lower temperature. It's going to want to puke that out into the overflow bottle. So that might have just been blown out of the overflow. So let's start with a good pressure cap, get it full, and then that will also almost dub as a pressure test because once it's holding pressure, now you're going to be able to look and see where, where the coolant might coming be from. from. And then always, always be careful. Don't open a hot radiator cap. We don't want to see anybody get burned or, or hurt. Just let it let it cool down or run some water across the surface of the radiator. And, and so the first thing is to find out where there's any leaks. Once we identify the leaks, we've got to get the leaks fixed. And at the same time, We've got to get all the gook and mud and garbage. We just call it Dex Cool Death. Uh, oh, get, yeah. You get, get that out and then get good, fresh, clean coolant. Uh, and it might take a couple flushes. The other thing you can use is don't use dishwashing soap that you would wash your hands with. But what we use in the shop is dishwashing detergent that you would squirt from in the, the dishwashing in machine. Your dishwashing machine. That will clean a lot of the scale. Get, and that will really help get oils and anything that's in there out. For sure. When we come back, we've got open lines at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTR. We've got Ruben, Steve, and Bill. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. He's Dave Riccio, Aaron Nelson from Air Park Auto Service. I'm Matt Allen, and we are helping you with your car every Saturday at 11, as always. And uh, the best way for, you, for us to help you is to get involved and give us a call at 602 602- 277-5827 or 602-277-KTAR if that helps you remember. And uh, today we're talking about air conditioning. Uh, we're talking about anything you want to talk about uh, related to your car. So. I'm getting off topic because I'm a cyclist and Aaron's a cyclist and we we're just discussing how many times we've been hit by cars <laughs> and how many times we've been honked at. <laughs> and I, w- I want to put an end to it. If you see a bicyclist and you're driving next to him, give him two or three feet. Easy. And if you honk at him, I'm telling you right now, if you're that guy, you're morally bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you, need to, you need to go make amends if you've been honking at bike lists. I would uh, honk it. I would run your tail over if I saw you. <laughs> <laughs> I <know. laughs> well, I, you know what? Well, 
I don't know. My wife makes fun of me because sometimes <laughs> when I ride my bike, I carry a really big gun on my side because they don't see bikes, but they do see guns. <laughs> and no one honks at me when I'm carrying a gun. <laughs> well, I agree with you. But you know what really annoys me is the guy that wants to be have the respect of the motorcycle. I mean, the bike's in the lane. You have to treat them like a car. They're spo- they have every right to be there. Yep. You're blowing the traffic. But what grinds me is the guy in the cruiser with the cup holder. He's got no helmet, no nothing, and he wants to be a car. <laughs> Get on the sidewalk if you're that guy. You can't ride down the sidewalk, and especially if you're drinking in that cup holder. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it blows it to the Oh, boy, we'll really get off topic here. <laughs> so. so anyway, we've got a very patient Reuben in Phoenix on a 2003 F-150. Go ahead, Reuben. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. And that's a 250, Dave. 250. Yes. Hi. Um, thank you for the show, you guys. Um, and it's a 2005 uh, F-250 Super Duty uh, diesel, 6.0. And uh, I get in a really hard cold star. Um, he rubbles a lot and... I want to know what is wrong with it. Uh, some people tell me there is a fuel injector or the FICM. So I'd like to know either if you, if you, there's injectors, there's any way can I uh, find out which ones they are, if they have to be replaced, only the damaged ones or all of them or, or the uh, FICM um, model to be fixed. Sure. Now, do you have, are you getting any smoke with that hard starting issue? Yes, yes. Uh, white smoke? Uh, no, not white. Okay. Well, and uh, it, when it gets um, warming up, it runs fine. Uh, it has less power than before, but it, it runs fine when it, after it warms up. Okay. Well, a couple things. What part of Phoenix are you in, Ruben? Uh, I'm on uh, North Phoenix. Okay. Well, we've got a couple. We've got three of the shops on Bumper to Bumper Radio that are Bosch Diesel Service Center. So you can find those at bumper to bumper radio dot com if you need help. Kurt's Auto Repair is the one in the North Valley. We've got Virginia Auto Service in Central Phoenix, and then in Chandler area, we've got Automotive Diagnostics. Now, <clears throat> but you know, well, but back for his question, the cold starting issue. There's there's tons of sensors on this on this truck. We need to number one, the computer needs to recognize what this temperature is outside. So if it's cold and it's 40 degrees and the computer is recognizing a signal that the sensor is telling it it's 80 degrees outside, that could be your problem. That's your first problem. Com- the computer has to understand what the real temperature is. We very well could have a fuel injector problem. A lot of good diesel guys can tell you what the problem is by the color of the smoke coming out of the tailpipe. Uh, white is usually a, I don't even want to say that. That is, that, is, that, is, that is not me, the good diesel guy. You know, um, I admittedly don't know much about diesels. I mean, other than the fact they don't have a spark plug. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and, and then dead to the injector problem, if there is one, it just just depends on the system. I mean, those, those, those are difficult to access with the F 250s. A lot of times the cab has to come off. I've got one in my excursion. With nearly ninety thousand miles on it, fingers crossed. Knock on some wood. It's uh, haven't had problems, but it, it's not a not a do-it-yourselfer kind of project. I don't think it, it could be the the FICM, the Ficum fuel injection control module. But those are expensive guesses. So it, it's right. really something that needs a needs a, a diagnosis, proper diagnosis. I mean, we could guess all day long, probably just like the guys that told you injectors or uh, or the module, but. Need to dial it down. Well, thanks for the call, Ruben. And again, bumper to bumper radio.com if you're looking for one of those Bosch diesel certified centers. And we've got Bill in Phoenix with a 2004 Dodge Ram 1500. And this one has gas, so I can get involved. (laughs) How are you guys doing? Good. And yourself? Not bad. Okay, mine, I've got a, it's got the Hemi in it. And I've got a problem with the condenser fan motor not wanting to turn on when the AC is on, and I've replaced the condenser fan motor, and it still don't come on. Where would I go from there? Is there a pressure switch that makes that thing work? Yeah. Now, so the, the the condenser fan motor doesn't turn on when you turn the air conditioning on. Well, there's there's we need a roadmap. We need a wiring diagram. That's the first place I would have my guys start. Or Aaron, I mean, you depending on that, uh, 2004, it probably has bi-directional controls, we call it, with the scanner. What right, would, go in, go, yeah, get in with the scanner and diagnose it that way and see what's going on to it. Yeah, and what, and what I mean by the directional controls, we can say, okay, computer, turn on the fan. We have, you know, uh, to make it simple, 
we have a, a, a scan tool. It's not your code reader. It's the factory deal. And usually they use laptops or a bigger console. And we can get in there and we can say, okay, we're going to turn the fan on. And then the fan doesn't come on. Well, now we have to understand, is the is the car following the directions of the computer? Or does the computer still have the power to force that fan to come on by triggering a solid state relay within the computer that sends the ground signal to the to the fan relay. So I would go back, you know, in the, in the absence of a scanner and a, yeah, I would controls, look, I would go backwards from the fan looking at a wiring diagram. See what's in line and go to those pieces. I mean, yeah. and if it's a relay issue, you can tap on a relay to see if that changes the situation or a pressure switch for that matter. Yeah, and you could take, for example, look in the fuse box under the hood in the relay center, and you're going to see, maybe you'll see condenser fan relay, and next to that maybe there's a horn relay. Mark them. Pull them out and look and see if the connectors are the same. If they're interchangeable, swap. just swap them, and and that might help you. Um, we need to understand how that works. Is it constantly have power and then it gets a variable ground, or does it always have power in the relay, or does it always have ground and the relay provides the power? So you're going to need a wiring diagram and a test light at least. Thanks so much for the call, Bill. We are going to go with, looks like, Al in Scottsdale on a 2005 Ford F-150. Go ahead, Al. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Uh, the problem that I have is uh, it's, it, there's a service bolt now on this, but I, it doesn't, when I look it up, it doesn't say anything. It's almost like as if I got something in the bed that's sliding around when I, take, when I first take off. Do you? <laughs> but, and, no. And, and, you know, the drive shaft and everything all looks good and solid. I took it into a place one time, and they said they greased. Uh, they did something to the drive shaft to grease it if you have, if you have the, the dual that's, shaft, which I do. But I, that shop closed down now, so I can't find out what they did. They, that's the slip yoke that they greased. And what happens on, on uh, trucks is when you come to a stop or you leave a stop, the sus- suspension compresses and releases. That means a dry shaft has to get longer or shorter, and not by much, maybe by a quarter of an inch. But there's a special Teflon grease, and there's a bulletin from Ford for lubricating those splines so you don't get that, that clunking when you leave a stop. That's a pretty pretty common one there. And, so and did the, I, I, I was watching the race and almost <laughs> didn't pay attention. <laughs> but bring did, it home. Bring did, it home. <laughs> did, did we say the noise went away for a short period of time after that was greased? Yeah. And why? Like, yeah, so do they actually, is there a grease fitting in there? there? No, it's not actually a grease fitting. So what needs to happen is the dry shaft needs to be unbolted. The slip okay. yoke needs to be taken apart, and there literally is a special Teflon grease. Ford's got their blue Teflon grease. GM, GM has their Teflon grease. But it's, it's a notorious problem across the industry, and it's not a lubricated spline. So otherwise, they get dry over time. They get a little bit of water in there, a little bit of rust. It's not a major repair. You know, we pull them out and grease them for customers on a regular basis. And most of them have just come to get used to that clunking when they leave a stop. And uh, we fix it. We don't tell them. And they're like, wow, man, look well, at that. It's smooth as silk. What I hate, though, is uh, just, it, 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 it's normal. <laughs> no, it's not normal. And, it's and not normal. So you could view that as maintenance and just go get that done to eliminate it because it probably needs to be done anyway and see if that helps. And then maybe we start chasing down the problem. I see we're in Scottsdale. A um, couple of good shops. We've got Whitey's Auto Repair. We've got Jim at uh, uh, Car Repair Company. Those uh, are in South Scottsdale. South Scottsdale. North Scottsdale, we've got Aaron at Air Park Auto. Go see Aaron. He'll know we just had this conversation about the grease. He'll get you some blue grease and get you fixed up. And then uh, if you ever went directly to a drive shaft shop, we do have a drive shaft shop at bumper to bumper radiocom So all those. Hope that helps. Let's go ahead and go with uh, Nathan. I'm sorry, no, Judy on 01 Buick Century. Go ahead, Judy. You're on bumper to bumper radio Hi. Uh, I just want to thank you for your program. Uh, I'm a lady that doesn't know too much about cars, but I have a 2001 Buick Century. And I noticed, um, oh, after being gone about four months, the car sat for a while until my kids started driving it. But I have my coolant light keeps popping on. And I took it over to Sears, and uh, they said, oh, it was probably the sensory or maybe a bubble in it because... Um, the light stayed on, and I had plenty of fluid. Uh, prior to that, I knew I had an oil leak, and um, then the second time I took it over, uh, maybe about a week ago, he said there was oil <laughs> going into the coolant, and uh, not to drive it until I could afford to get it fixed. So I just 
kind of wanted your advice on what you think is happening. It's quite an expensive procedure, I guess. It's something to do with the gaskets and the manifold. And uh. yeah. How many miles are in this car, Judy? Oh, dear. <laughs> Roughly. Round, round number. The dashboard is broken, or there's no lights that come up, so I have no idea. I bought it a couple years back. It had about 60000 on it. Okay. That's and normal. So it, this is probably a pretty, uh, when I say simple repair, I mean, all things are simple if you know what you're doing. Um, mm. I don't no know. No wonder everything's so hard. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder it is. I don't, I, I think a full mechanical shop, like one of the ones you would find on bumper to bumper, would be a place to go. I don't know that Sears is the right spot for that. They're good for batteries and oil changes and some of that stuff. So there's two things that are happening, or multiple things happening here, but... The first thing, there is a level sensor either in the radiator or in what we call an expansion tank up on the, on, on maybe on the fender well under the hood or something like in that area. And when that gets low, it's just like the float in your toilet, kind of. It doesn't add water, but it turns on the light. Sometimes those floats will get saturated. They're foam sometimes or they're a, like a air ball that they, they get penetrated and they sink. So that could be why the light was on or it was on because it was low because you're losing this coolant into the oil. And this is a, a fairly common problem. I, you probably have a 3.1 liter engine in that car and, and likely what's happening is the intake manifold gasket is leaking and allowing the coolant to mix with the water. And the advice to not drive that car is very good. Do not drive it because you could ruin the bottom end of the engine uh, a bearing, wash out a bearing because there's not proper lubrication and go to a very expensive repair from what could be, you know, you could do that repair several different ways. Aaron, do you guys do just a gasket or do you tend to maybe, hey, while we're there, let's take care of the spark plug wire. We're going to put a thermostat. or it all, it all depends. We look at it all and see how bad they are. If the plugs are bad or the wires are bad right there, you have it apart, change them out, or just go and do the gasket. A lot of cars you can do. Yeah, and then we've got to do probably two oil changes, get all the, the gook. Out of there. Out of so. there. And, uh, yeah, so it, it's a... When you come back, we've got Laurel, uh, Robert, and Nathan. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Okay, we're back. I'm <laughs> Matt. Oh, <laughs> you just drove right over top little, of me. A little, little, little <laughs> slow at the, at, the, at the switch there, Dave. Uh, we're back. I'm Matt. He's Dave. We've got Aaron Nelson from Air Park Auto Service helping us, and we're going to get right after it here. We've got a board full of calls. We might be able to squeeze in a couple more at 602-277-5827. And uh, remember, we're here every Saturday at 11, and Dave, you're pointing to yourself. What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> uh, next week, just so you know, before I forget to tell you, we're going to have Battery Week. You know, in Arizona, you're replacing batteries all the time, and why is that? So we've got a battery expert in studio with us and he's going to tell us why that happens so and i'll be hope, scuba diving and you're going to be scuba diving <laughs> <laughs> all right nathan has a volkswagen passat and he's been patiently waiting what can we help you with on your o2 volkswagen nathan hey guys i had a um a radiator replaced probably about three or four months ago from an oil cooler that went bad and luckily it's something that we caught we caught soon so no more gunk in my cooling cooling system but after the repair was done my ac stopped working um it blows everything comes on compressor kicks on fan kicks on it just doesn't get cold so i i took it over to a friend's house who had a gauge that i could hook up to the system and there was definitely free on in there so i'm kind of at a at a loss for what it could could be what makes you think there was definitely a free on in there well we got one of those those charging kits um that he, he had the gauge from that he used on a on a mini cooper that he has so we popped it on there and and basically we just we read the pressure and it said it was you know it was full. Okay, what was that pressure? Because I don't know. I don't, is, maybe some of those do-it-yourself kits. There is a line that says full, but I doubt it. Um, you know, it wasn't number-wise. It was color-coded, so okay. it was like yellow, green, red. Okay. Not, that may not be the order, but that was the the, the basics of it. Sure. Can you? Uh, I would say you know just one way is go yeah go under you know with the hood open grab the air conditioned lines and one of them should be hot and one of them should be cold if everything's running and that's going to tell us that that air conditioned action is happening then then maybe we have an airflow issue in the car with some blend door issue like we talked about earlier so we need to know if that's really happening because if that line's not getting cold we're not getting cooling well and it's only half the story too the problem on that system 
is I believe that's a constant run compressor. So the, it's not that the compressor's on, it's always on. You can't even turn it off. And it's got a variable vein inside that is changing the compression of that. So ideally, in a let's just say generically speaking, um, if you have 40 pounds of pressure on the low side, you would maybe be producing 40 degree air at best. You also need to have high pressure because the high and the low pressure, the diff where that goes to an expansion valve or an orifice, that's where it changes from a liquid to a gas and condenses it. And, you know, all the stuff that happens with the gases, Ward Atkinson's probably going to call me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm yeah, not yeah. saying it right. Selling curses. <laughs> uh, but um, we don't know what the high side pressure is. We have to know the high side. If it's not pumping and making pressure, you can have low side all you want. It might just be the static pressure, so you're not going to make cold air. But like Dave said, the fat lines, the bigger lines, are the low pressure, and they should be cold to the touch. And the highs should almost be where you can't hold on to them for much more than a second or two because that pressure should be 220 pounds maybe. So that's 200 degrees roughly. Thanks so much for the call, Nathan. And if you do bring that into like a bumper-to-bumper -bumper shop, again, 100 to $200, uh, you know, get you evacuate and recharge if there's, if there's no obvious leaks. So that may be a place to go. We're going to go with Laurel in Ahwatukee on a 2005 uh, Murano. Go ahead, Laurel. You're on Bumper to Bumper. Hi, guys. Um, I was uh, calling because I've been having an issue for about three months now, taking it into my mechanic. They looked at it for three days. And basically what's happening is when I accelerate, um, it doesn't matter what speed I'm going. When I accelerate, my car has a, a really nasty jerk. And sometimes it's just minor, and sometimes it's really bad. And after three days of having it, they called in a diagnostic specialist. They couldn't figure anything out. And I was just curious if you guys might have any ideas as to what it could be. I mean, I feel like they've tried everything, but... Is this jerk so hard that it would spill your coffee in the cup holder kind of jerk? Um, sometimes it depends on, like, if I'm going around 50, 60, and I decelerate, and then I accelerate again, sometimes it can be that bad. But it's not always that bad. And is it fairly consistent? Because that's going to make it a hard or easy problem to fix. If we can duplicate it over and over again, it's just a matter of hooking up test tools and different test tools till we get to what's what may be causing it. So is it consistent? Um, unfortunately, it's not very consistent. You could drive it for 10 minutes, and it wouldn't do it at all. Um, and then, you know, you might be at a stoplight and accelerate, and then it does it really bad. It's just, it really is very inconsistent, which is, I think, the most frustrating thing about it. Right. I would say, I mean, to, to figure this out here on radio is going to be tough. Send right. us an email at bumper -to -bumper radio com. That comes to either Matt's or my email. We both see it. And uh, we've got some Nissan experts, you know, Joel at Arizona Imports. We'll run it by him uh, and see if he's run into it or knows of anything. And uh, look at the problem database. I mean, somebody's, a lot of Murano's on the road. Somebody's probably ran into that before. Uh, so we can maybe we'll get lucky there. Otherwise, other than that, it's just good diagnostic, which is going to be hooking up test tools and driving it and making it happen. Uh, is, that, at, is that shop able to duplicate the problem and they just can't figure yeah. it out? Okay. Wow. Yeah, they were able to duplicate it. Uh, like I said, they had it for three days, and they would. They kept trying all different things. They put in new parts. The new parts weren't making a difference. Um, like I said, they called in a specialist, and he hooked up all of his special tools, and they couldn't get it to uh, trigger anything um, through the computer system of the car. Uh, and so they just couldn't. They could never give me a final diagnosis. They told me to try filling it with premium fuel. For a couple times, I was using just regular, not-so-fabulous not fuel, and so they said use the Chevron Tecron for a couple tanks and see if that makes a difference, and it really hasn't. I'm Oops. I right. <clears throat> Well, fuel, yeah. I mean, she brought up fuel, but that's a good point because that's, that's our blog at KTR.com. Matt wrote a nice blog about which fuel you should be using. And, and uh, But, it, it, you know, three days in a shop, so, well, that sounds like a long time. For an inter intermittent issue, it's not. And one of the pressures that we feel, I'm mean, just letting you know as the consumer, is we feel bad when we don't have an answer right away and you're calling back and you're calling back. Uh, it's tough. You know, sometimes we gotta we got to set it off to the side, think about it, you know, think, hey, we can hook up this tool, that tool, the other tool, and then go road test it. And then we have to make it happen while we're looking at the tools. Uh, the other thing, I mean, there's some logging that we can do with some scanners to see what goes offline. But if it's that abrupt, something's, something's got to be coming up. Something's going offline. Yeah, the, and what we do, too, at our shop is it's, fairly often is we'll have a technician just drive the car home. 
if you can allow them to do that and gas won't be your problem but there's something there and it's just it's probably it's obviously a tough one so hey thanks aaron for coming in and helping us help our listeners with their uh, car (laughs) how can we get a hold of air park auto service 480-998-1605 or our website is airparkautoservice.com for sure and it's just one of the great shops you'll find at bumper to bumper radio.com thanks peter for putting on a great show be sure next week not to miss Battery Week. He is Matt Allen, and I am Dave Riccio. This is Bumper to Bumper Radio.